Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Ciafferdini with Ghosty Talk. I'm here with John Michael McDonough to talk about his film, Calvary. Thank you for coming to Dallas. Thank you. Uh, it's a surreal adventure. It's like a sur you know, surreal Western, you know, uh, alone, not to say gunman, you know, yeah. going through the, his week, knowing his doom is coming, but uh, he's helping people, but nobody can really help him. So. Yeah, it's basically High Noon. I kind uh -huh. of ripped off that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you get, you got to put a great spin on it, you know. Yeah, it's... I mean, it has a kind of the murder mystery element to it. Mm -hmm. It has all the, you know, this strange eccentric characters that he comes across in this town. But yeah, it's, it's the lone man trying to do good when all these forces are opposed against him, mm -hmm. I guess you could say, which is a Western kind of structure, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, the writing is great. It's really, it's witty and sharp. There's no fluff. And it feels like the scenes were structured to be the, structured to be the same way. Can you talk about the shooting style? It's, it, it was like no unnecessary movements. Everything was locked a lot of the time. Yeah, I, don't, I tend not to move the camera around a lot. But I think that comes out of the story I wanted to tell. I've got another script I may do in America next year that is a much more, the storytelling is much more dynamic. So I think the visual style will be much more dynamic. On this, I knew, you know, you're right, there isn't going to be a lot of camera movement. It's going to be very precisely framed. It was influenced by a painter called Andrew Wyeth, and so a lot of the framing and the kind of the somber palette is based on him. Mm -hmm. um, the writing is kind of very spare. There's not a lot of fat on, in the film. When we shot the film, I think we only cut maybe two scenes from, from the screenplay. And I don't, I don't shoot that many takes either, you know, mm -hmm. maybe three or four. And then move on. There's also, I don't like a lot of establishing shots. I don't like anything that's, you know, you see movies and there's shots there and you go, they didn't need that. Why is that there? Or there's, there's, even when they have like opening title sequences, of, let's say where they're flying over Boston or over New York City. And mm -hmm. It's like, you've seen these before, haven't we? A hundred times. Why, why yeah. not just tell the story? Absolutely. So I try to get remove anything I think is completely extraneous and just get down to the core of the story. Mm -hmm. Well, the story starts off very enticing, uh, the, the shot on Brendan Gleeson while he's in the confessional booth. Uh, what's interesting about that is that that scene by itself could be a trailer by itself. Yeah, it's, you it's know? almost a three-act structure uh -huh. to the opening scene. It's, mm -hmm. it's telling an entire story. It's, 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 I like pre-credit sequences in movies, so it's kind of setting up the whole movie in just one shot, basically. Mm -hmm. And Brendan gives a kind of acting masterclass, you know, all the different responses you could go through in relation to he's being threatened by a guy who's been abused, so he's taken on board the fact his life is being threatened, but he's also taken on board the fact the guy's really suffered, you know. Then he's starting to think about, what do I do? How can I speak to it? So there's lots and lots of things going on. So I think any student of acting should watch that scene, you know, see there's, there's a lot to get out of it. Now, when you started working with Brendan, what do you do to make him work his magic? I mean, is he his own animal? Is he just, do you say action and he goes? Yeah, I mean, obviously you talk through the entire script and everything, and we would have maybe five days of rehearsal, which isn't bad for a movie. Usually, you know, I read about a lot of directors who don't get any rehearsal. Um, but I cast, I tend to cast actors who are very definitive about what they're going to do, so they don't really need a lot of notes, you know. Mm -hmm. They're pretty intelligent people who kind of, in a way, just want to be left alone. They've got a pretty good idea what they're going to do. It would be it would be rare that I'd have to, you know, go onto the set and say, I think you've got that slightly wrong. You know, they, you know, they very intelligent people know their characters really well, really mm -hmm. well. I mean, obviously, I've written the script, so I I know them better. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But as long as they don't veer too far from my idea of it, I'm pretty prepared to be collaborative. Mm -hmm. Now, working with so many different actors and creating these very eccentric characters, it seems like it might have been difficult to come up with so many different people who are so different and so you know unique and colorful. At, at what point in the process did things maybe get easier? Or were they never difficult to begin with? Um, in a way, it kind of the, uh, when I started with the idea of a good priest, I started to think, well, what does a priest do in this community where they kind of try to help people whose marriages are in trouble? So that would lead to the creation of Chris O'Dowd's character and mm -hmm. Paul O'Rourke who plays his wife. They minister to the sick, so that's M. Emmett Walsh, the old man in the arms. Um, they perform the last rites, so that's how he meets the doctor, Aidan Gillen, and the Mary Jose Crows, the French widow. So the characters start to be created from the form of plot dynamics. But then you're obviously you're trying to make them unique and original, and maybe sometimes I go too far in mm -hmm. making them too eccentric or too oddball. But it's just because, you know, I'm sitting alone in a room and I'm bored, so I always push the characters <laughs> to amuse myself as much as anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but I like those kind of movies. I like the kind of 
the screwball comedies of the 30s, Preston Sturges or the Coen Brothers movies, where they have those kind of very, I hate the word quirky, but that idiosyncratic characters. So that's uh -huh. just something I like, and I think if I liked it, maybe the audience would as well. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. They're not archetypes. You can't really size them up until they, until they start talking. And, yeah. And they reveal themselves throughout the, the film, like the agnostic doctor or the police chief and his lover. Yeah. You, you can't peg that, you know, until you get them talking. So yeah. It's very I mean, interesting. Like um, Dylan Moran's character, the rich man who kind of believes in nothing and not, not even his own wealth. You know, nothing mm -hmm. seems to make him happy. Well, and, you know, on face value, that's a really kind of horrible, nasty character you wouldn't want to meet. But he at the end of the movie, actually asks for help. He's one of the few characters he does mm -hmm. ask for help. And you real, realize that he is really suffering, you know. So it's trying to do that thing, pre present a character who on face value is one thing, and then try to develop them through the movie so that by the end you have a different outlook on their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing you introduced very well is uh, some humor. Now, I'm curious, would you consider this a dark comedy? Uh, it was a dark comedy when I wrote it, okay. I think. It got a lot darker as when the actors came in to perform it and as we were shooting. I think what happens is good actors try to find a deeper character, so they, they don't want to just play the gags or the jokes. They want to go under the character. Mm -hmm. And when you're going deeper into a character, I guess it becomes, the character becomes heavier in a way. So somber scenes are more somber, you know. Um, and good dramatic actors, I guess, although there are a lot of comedic actors in the movie, they kind of want to find the drama rather than do any kind of cheap gags or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it started off as a dark comedy. I, I, I would now say it's a drama with, with humor. Okay. Because, <laughs> yeah, going back to the intro, it, it really it grounds you and kind of tells you what this movie is going to be. And then you get Chris O'Dowd in the meat house. Like, yeah, oh, you're switching back and <laughs> forth from really dark scenes to really kind of screwball dialogue yeah. in a way, which is meant to kind of... Is, Hopefully the audience finds that amusing, but it, sh it should also kind of wrong foot them so they're not quite sure where the film's going to go, uh -huh. how it's all going to play out. I think too often now, you know, we see a movie and from the first 10 minutes, we know what the ending's going to be. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's trying to do the opposite of that. Well, as you grew from this, uh, from the guard to this, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, War on Everyone? What, how's things going with that? Um, I'm hoping to shoot that in the first quarter of next year. Okay. Uh, Michael Pena and Garrett Hedlund, the cast, it's about two really corrupt cops mm -hmm. who go around uh, framing criminals um, and they eventually cross someone who's more dangerous than they are or, mm -hmm. or is he, you know. Okay. It's kind of like a French connection but with lots of jokes, that's the way I look at it. Although I find the French connection quite funny, I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> Gene Hackman's performance. Um, so that's what it's about. I mean, where it's set, it was originally set in Texas. But, you know, when you get into the finance of, of a movie, the producers come to you and say, well, there are better tax breaks in Louisiana, and could, okay. you, could you shoot in Louisiana? Um, so we're going through all that now. It's like I'm going to have to start making those decisions. Do I move it somewhere else? Will it still play out in that, in, you know, in a town in Louisiana? So I'm going to have to go on location and see if that all happens. But uh, the actors are very committed to it. It's still in my kind of budget range, like 8 to $10 million. Okay. Um, so I'm pretty hopeful it's all going to... It's all going to go next year. Okay. Do you think you'll carry some of the same shooting styles? And uh, I think um, I think I uh, would hope this would be a lot more sort of visually dynamic. I think this, you know, there's the two cops are always running, chasing criminals, kicking okay. doors in. You know, so gotcha. you'd assume you, I'd have to do a, a visual dynamic that relates to that kind of movement. You know. Excellent. If you remember the French Connection, you know they had those long scenes where they're running after muggers and all that uh -huh. kind of things through the streets of New York. So it has that kind of vibe to it. Cool. We'll look forward to that, but this was just fantastic. I think the cast and writing was just spot on and superb. So. Oh, thanks a lot. Congratulations. Cheers. Thank you.